Thank you here with Clay and Angela. And as we're doing, so I'm going to invite participants to start uh, to start in questions. We'll take a few minutes from questions. Or Clay and so the first question I see here. Uh, sorry, you can see here is about boil water advisories, I believe. Uh, so, Angela, you spoke to the fact that a lot of uh, First Nations communities have are under boil water advisories. And so, can you speak about how uh, the government is investing in, in improving that situation, particularly around how communities are being prepared to take over the control of those plants? Um, I, I can only speak to what I've heard, and you know, there are um, First Nations communities who have. Uh, been working with the federal government under the new Safe Drinking Water First, for First Nations Act, um, and they have reduced the numbers on oil advi or long-term advisories. But that doesn't get to everything and everybody. And I think um, part of the issue for First Nations is they don't have the control um, that maybe they should, and you know. Um, Communities should have the control over when their stuff is getting done, not the government saying, okay, well, we're going to do community A this year and then community B next year kind of thing. Um, and that's problematic. And I, I honestly, I'm not sure how that works, but I do know that of the ones that are, are still on, like, long-term boil advisories, um, a lot of them have water issues that aren't just for running water into a house, like, they'll have water issues within their groundwater. So this is this is bigger than just, um, you know, trying to put in a, a sewage system or a septic system. And then some of them, they get off of boil advisory, and then the next thing that happens, they're back on it, right? So the government will say, yay, look at us. We've gotten rid of this boil advisory, and like two weeks later, they're back on a, a boil advisory. So I'm not sure how... We um, help them to, to get off of them permanently because I feel as though the government's not doing a very good job of that. But I do know that we need to do more than we're doing. Thank you. I think uh, definitely a contributing factor is this ongoing under resource and and we've seen right now the COVID nineteen response. So that's an example. I think the government has pledged three hundred and fifteen million and then the pandemic assistance for indigenous people, which is our set of right? So that right so we see that even in this response of in inequity, the resources have been invested are by no means proportional to the uh, number of indigenous people in this country. So thank you for that, Angela. I'm going to continue here with our questions. The next question has to do with uh, the impact, the proportionate impact of COVID-19. Uh, so uh, the question is, it's clear that Indigenous peoples and Black Canadians are, would not keep in mind as these policies have been developed. Uh, we need to have a new normal, and we cannot go back to things as they were before. How do we create a different reality? Wow, that's a tough question. And hi, Camille. <laughs> um, for both. Right. Yeah, I think so. That's okay. that's a tough question. You say something, Clay. <laughs> well, I, I I think again you got to go back to um, history is very important, right? I mean, a hundred years ago we had the same thing. A huge virus had wiped out thousands, tens of thousands of people, right? During the First World War, it actually killed more people than the war itself. So once that became once they got over that and people started going back, they never really, they never changed, right, their policies. So I think you're looking at history and you could learn from that and say, okay, well, you know, it's a big question. So how do we go back to normal? I don't, I don't think we should go back to normal because we're embracing the reality is that I know a lot of people are going to argue this, but the reality is that the, the, the whole cause of this is capitalism, right, mm -hmm. caused this whole thing. If you know your history, you look at the where it came from, China, and in the 70s, they were starving, right? They, they, they put into act their own uh, 
their people were starving. So they encouraged their own people to, to, to embrace capitalism, to feed themselves and everything. And so you have all these wet farms, et cetera, you know, and, and it became this multi-million dollar business and for a handful of rich people who liked exotic animals to eat. And so this would cause it, and that's the root of it, and that's capitalism, right? And it just spread, right? So going back to when I'm thinking about it, I really like. I'm really trying to say, okay, we got a we, we got a, a reality check here. We got to really look at things and say, and take that courage and really question these things. And so, what I'm looking at when I turn on the news every day, I you know I, I have this ritual I do every day. It's kind of like Groundhog Day every day for my house, right? Because I'm 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 at my home, and and so I turn you know, I have my coffee, look at the news, and I look at these these politicians, and, and they're blaming each other, and they're 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 bickering, and their and their their um, politics are getting involved, and all this, and 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 they're taking no responsibility. So Canada is doing okay, but I'm not that convinced. They're doing enough for um, the most vulnerable people. Right, that the poor and the majority are in a large majority are indigenous. I use that word, indigenous. Um, so I think th they need to take responsibility. So I go back a few years back when uh, you know SARS. You know, I, I mean, again, look at what they did. They handed out body bags to the indigenous communities. I mean, that's just appalling, right? They're not doing that now. I mean, some now they're like, oh, we're all in this together. So let's, uh, that's what they're saying. But really, are they? So they need to take that responsibility and say, look, we're in this together and we need to take care of our people and we need to address the indigenous community and give them what they need to, to uh, take care of themselves. But again, it's that whole idea of capitalism and I know a lot of people got it like again a lot of people have a lot of energy invested in that but I'm and I'm very this is why I'm always going back to the identity of what who we are the people right and our culture our spiritual practices I mean we were a vast nations we're over 600 nations before the, the colonialists came here the colonists came here right and we solved those problems we we had we had our way of life. We had a way of dealing. We recognized that we were the people, and we can we like don't get me wrong. We slaughtered each other too, just like the tribes of Europe, Asia, Africa. They all have their stories, but eventually someone got up and spoke and said, we "Reminded the people that this is who we are. We are the people. We are the human beings, and this is our way of life. Our relationship to the earth, the sun, the sky." everything and so let's have peace and so we were okay with that we were at peace with that and so we had these governed systems of way of practice you know i asked my elders long time ago long time ago i'm old now uh and i'm on my way out <laughs> so to speak and and i asked them this when i was younger it says will we ever go back to the way of our ancestors and so through ceremony they answered that question, and the answer is no. Okay? We're not going to. The days of the buffalo, I'll say, are gone. They ain't ever coming back. But you need to understand this: that you have your that your way of life is still here, and you can share it in a way of being, in a way of in, in, in all of these things of the earth, and and in, in, in having those seven grandfather teachings of respect, and in in, in love, and in, 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 in wisdom and, and courage and humility and honesty and respect, all of these things. And so we started learning these things again and picking them up, and then we started practicing. And so we're taking that responsibility, but we need allies. We need support, and, and, and our allies are supporting us now. They're helping us grow into uh, – and, you know, Angela, you guys were talking about the Indian Act, and I know people are probably curious about the Indian Act, and, and, I, and I talk about it a lot, but I'll just say this about the Indian Act. I tried to read it. It's an impossible read because it's a huge report document. It's, it's like it's huge. But I've defined it very simply for everyone to understand what it is. The Indian Act itself is an act. It says it in itself, an act. It defines us as Indians 
and the act is and the act is to turn us into something we didn't want to be mm -hmm. so-called citizens right and so that's the, the Indian Act in a nutshell and there's a simple version of the Indian Act I encourage you to read it but it, that's still a, it's, it's still an impossible read but that's the Indian Act in a nutshell and so what Angela was talking about the history of all of our people and so this led up to today right with COVID and our communities are getting together we're supporting each other in the best way we can with limited resources that we have and I've noticed this over especially in Toronto all the agencies of Toronto are banding together right and saying okay we're, we're going to work on this we're going to take care of our people but we also need support and we also need to, I mean, people need to be accountable for what what has not been given right, historically and all of these things so it's very important that we understand this and we work together and this is what I'm saying about this sense of empathy because when I woke up to this reality of COVID-19 I said no I'm gonna I'm gonna put all everything aside and, and, and just see everybody as human beings and say let's let's talk let's work together because we're in this together and I know it's a challenge and I, I'm, it sounds like I'm repeating myself but it's such a challenge for people because we're so caught up in these other identities, right? We're never going to get anywhere as human beings unless we address that first, right? And our spiritual leaders, not just our spiritual leaders, but other faiths, because I talk to other faiths, and I talk to them, and we're all saying the same thing in a different way, coming together and saying, look, we need to address this if we're going to, if we're going to evolve as human beings because we need to do this because this is a reminder and I know a lot of people are getting, um, I try not to listen to them about the doom and gloom that the human beings are being punished, et cetera, and all this. No, we created this. Human beings did this through our, our lack of empathy towards other human beings. And so we need to understand that and so to evolve in our minds. So it starts with our mind, a good mind. So when our minds are clear and we're coherent, we understand our thoughts and we can come up with these solutions. I have no solution. So I'm looking to the youth and say, look, I'm caught up in my fears, my doubts, my insecurities. I'm working on them. But I'm saying to the youth now, it's up to you now, right? It's up to you to make these changes towards our policies and to question everything and all of these things and to, and to move forward as human beings in native culture and native spirituality has I think has a part to play in that because we're still connected to the earth the reality is most people do not see the earth as the mother that I was raised to see I see the earth as the mother he is the mother of all mothers he gave birth to us the bone the flesh the blood liquids right that I mentioned earlier. So when we can acknowledge this, I think we can come up with those solutions because I don't have them, right? I, I just point out things once in a while, all of this. But when I think of the youth, I say, yes, you guys go forward, right? I, I, what I mean by that is youth is good mind and, and get past this race thing, this gender thing, and all those other things and just say, look, we're in this together. And I think this is an opportunity as human beings and we can take care of each other. And unfortunately, a lot of people are dying because of that race thing, that gender thing, that class thing, et cetera, all these other things, because all those things get in the way. And if people just wake up to this reality that who we are, and we, because we, creation, wherever you, whatever you want to call it, gave us the greatest gift called life in our intelligence, right? Our minds, it's the gift of gifts. You know, it, 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 we, 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 we can create things, so, but that, that thought needs to be injected in there and that courage to say, look, look beyond this capitalism, socialism, look beyond all these things because the newcomers brought all those concepts to this place called Turtle Island, right, what we call the Americas, North America. So when I look at it that way, I'm very, very um, optimistic about it all but I'm also praying for the people who don't who are suffering right and it's up to us the ones who have 
clear mind to step forward and work on their behalf, right? Because everyone else is just caught up in all those other things. So with that, I'm, I'm very, very um, hopeful. And I don't trust the word hope. And I, and I, I make this distinction between hope because if you look it up, right, what does it mean? It just means you're waiting around for something to happen, right? And I know people a lot of throw that word around a lot. And I'm like, no, we got to go beyond hope. We have to, you know, we have to be proactive. We have to, we have to, we have to um, think about these things and, 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 and be in active thinking. Like, I think, I pray, right? That's an active thing, right? I'm praying, whoever I pray to. So indigenous people, we've always had this, we never quarreled over our relationship to our, our creator, the great mystery that we call it, right? Some of us. So it's not it's not male, it's not female, it's beyond that. And so the great mystery, our creator, creations of created all this gave us life. So with that, I think that a lot of our our way of life is um, it's very important because we have something to offer and we're doing it, but we need to get support from our relatives. Right, and so um, Canada again <laughs> has really kind of dropped the ball. But I, I understand where they're coming from because they're caught up in this thing called capitalism. And after this whole thing is done, I'm really curious how what's going to happen because the markets are really horrible. They're going to be like I was talking to some philanthropists, um, a friend who was talking to the other philanthropists, and they're really concerned. They're really, they're like these millionaires, philanthropists, they're all concerned and they're all hoarding their money and they're, 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 they're worried about it all. And I'm like, so, okay, all right, because they were supporters before, but now they're worried about their own well-being, about their millions and, and all of this. So I realized that, okay, well, something needs to change, right? And I'm pretty optimistic about once we come out of this, and we will. It's going to take some time, but it's going to take an effort from all people, right? We'll get out of this, but I'm curious about what's going to happen to the whole market, the whole capitalist views and everything. Are people going to wake up? Because um, I'm just going to stop talking after this, but I was always told of the seventh fire, the seventh fire uh, of people awakening themselves, and we're in it. We're in the midst of the seventh fire. Um, and I really thought to myself that my children's children would have to deal with this, right? But now it's staring us in the face. So it's kind of woken me up, right, and said, okay, I need to deal with this, and I need to practice, and I need to cultivate, and I need to be strong and be supportive of the people who are less fortunate as me. Because right now there's a lot of indigenous people are really struggling just to pay their rent, to feed themselves, to feed their children. So my thoughts constantly thinking about all those people. So, but I'm also thinking of that seventh fire, and I want my children to acknowledge this, and they're doing it in their own way. So does that all make sense? <laughs> I know I went out. Evelyn, thank <laughs> thanks for that, Claire. I think. You talked about people awakening. I know in my own personal life, in my professional life, and just looking at what's happening across the globe, I am I, I am observing that if I think about just public health specific, I'm seeing this sort of renewed energy around advocacy. And and when you started speaking to us today, you talked about really starting with the self right, and really starting with empathy and compassion, which for many people is really the beginning of transformation. But I'm I'm seeing people elevating that. Uh, oh, and taking absolutely. that through to system change and that youth, I don't in our work especially we don't really bring in that youth voice quite often. But I, uh, I remember my my early public health life started as a young, a very young person. I was very engaged in youth advocacy, and I was um, reflecting with some colleagues that I think you know I'm kind of a bit older. Also, some youth, some young, and it's always. Uh, I think it's really important to drive the kinds of conversations we're having. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and I think it's, it's important. And, uh, and the root of it all is lack of empathy. 
right? That's the root of it. Of all, look at history, and if, if it's not, if it's, it's all uh, people. You see, again, <laughs> I'll point this out: that we're unique beings. We're truly unique. If you really look at as who we are as human beings, we're so unique in we're different from all other beings. We have this ability that all other beings don't, like our four-legged friends, the crawlers, the swimmers, the flyers, etc. They all follow something called natural law, right? They follow it, and they what we call indigenous people, we call it their original instructions, right? But as human beings, we're unique. This makes us different. We're so unique. We have this ability, right? Choose. And I just make this distinction between the choices we make. We can choose to be symbiotic beings, relationships, right? We're, we're uh, symbiotic. We're interdependent on each other, but independent at the same time. Or we can choose to be parasites, right? And I, and I make this joke a lot. No offense to parasites, <laughs> right? Parasites are necessary, but sometimes we act like parasites. Right? And that's that whole thing of, of empathy again. So again, it's you know it's that cultivate an empathy uh, internally, externally, all of this. Right. So that's very important, I think, if we're going to get through this, uh, and we will. Absolutely, great. Thank you, Clay. Angela, what are your thoughts about how do we create a different world post COVID? Um, I want to just mentioned something because I thought Pima had put something in the chat. I just want to speak to this because it it is another one of those uh, issues that I'm not sure people are aware. So um, you know how the federal government keeps saying that they're putting money out there for indigenous communities? Um, they have done that, but uh, they put the call out on Friday uh, or Thursday before the long weekend, and communities had to put grants in uh, by Monday. So when they say there's $15 million going to flow to First Nations, it's only flowing if a First Nation can write a grant in three days over a long weekend without much support and get it submitted, and then they get to find out if they get it or don't get it. So I just wanted to put that out there because I'm, I, I keep seeing media saying that this money is flowing, and it's not true. So that's the first thing I want to make sure that everybody understands. Second, I just wanted to follow up on Robin's water issue. Um, they tried to get water training for First Nations across Canada over the last few years, and um, they had people all trained in that, and then they didn't want to pay the money for the filters in the water filtration plants. I, I know this for a fact because I was in Lac La Ronge, and they needed the $1 million filter for the plant, and the federal government said, nope, sorry, not going to do that. And so they have a very large cistern as opposed to having a water filtration plant. So I think that what Canadians hear and what is actually happening are two different things. And I want to highlight that that happens a lot. Um, I often have to sit and bite my tongue because I hear it in the media and then, you know, it's not actually happening in Toronto. So I, I really wanted to just address both of those because to me they're both the same kind of issue that Health Canada and uh, Indigenous Services Canada will say that they're doing something that's not actually happening. So in terms of how do I see our world changing, I'm really hoping this is a revolution. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if that's what everybody else wants, but uh, I, you know, I we can't go back to rampant capitalism that you know hoards and rapes Mother Earth uh, in order for somebody to make wealth. Um, today I noticed that the Prime Minister of New Zealand took a 20% pay cut. She said if her countrymen were suffering, that she was going to suffer along with them. And so with that being said, I think that you know there was a pay raise that recently went to all our federal MPs. Why aren't they revoking that? Um, why aren't we making millionaires and billionaires across the country step up and do something um, they have more than enough money to help out, and I know that the, the stock market's going down, and, and I just keep thinking it's about oil, and do we even need oil? So that brings me to a whole other issue. That's the man camps, right? The whole idea that they're still building behind every Canadian's back, might I add, they're still building the pipelines, and I'm really 
upset that you know there's no media support for the wet sweating people and I know those pipelines are going there and I've seen pictures of the pipes sitting there waiting to be installed and yet we know that in January and February we'll, uh, Indigenous people were blockading across Canada so it's absolutely important Canadians understand what they're seeing in the media is not what's happening in First Nations communities and if we're really truly all on board even a majority not necessarily every single person but we're we're willing to start giving up some of the things that we think are great in the world in order to right the world and give some justice, um, that may put a, a big damper on capitalism. I, you know, I'm not that old, but <laughs> I've heard a lot of stories from my parents and my grandparents, and um, so there's this whole idea that when we had the Depression that people you know, reuse things, recycle things. Uh, they shared with their neighbors, their family, their extended family. Um, they shared within communities, and somehow we've gotten away from that. And one of the things I've been teaching for more than 10 years now is we need to create communities. People live in a house or an apartment or a condo, and then they, they never actually talk to people. You live on a farm, you're five miles away from your neighbor, you probably don't talk to them on a regular basis. We have to get back to the point where we're talking to people. And Clay said it very well that, you know, it's, it's about us connecting to ourselves, to Mother Earth, and to each other. And we have the ability to do that. And I don't know if it's just a lack of empathy as much as it is hedonism, right, that we want things that we don't necessarily need. Uh, having a new iPhone is not going to make your life better. Having you could still have the same phone. So, so I just kind of worry that we keep believing these things. It's the same as right now we're in a pandemic and I hear academics saying I'm really productive because I don't have any other worries in the world and I can do this. But really, you should be thinking right now, self-reflecting, going in, figuring out who you are, what it is you want when we come out of this pandemic um, because that's going to really dictate how the world looks next, right? The fact that we have people that can work from home, um, and I, I, I am one of them, and I'm privileged in that way, but I think it's important for us to start thinking about those things. Um, what will it look like in terms of what work is out there, and do we want to work for other organizations? This is a relatively new concept, right? This really is maybe 150 years, 200 years old. It's not, um, it's not been all of uh, human life. It's it's a creation of man and we have to figure out is mother nature or mother earth something we need to protect or not because you know at this point I think that's what I'm seeing is a battle of capitalism versus um, what we're supposed to be loving which is all of creation and, and I don't see that and I really hope that people will start doing that and uh, I just see Blake had posted, live simply so that others may simply live. And I think that's a really eloquent way to say that we need to start thinking about that. Great. Thank you so much for that, Angela. And I think um, I have a quote up here from Leanne Simpson, who's an Ashnabi scholar, and she talks about uh, the importance of a collective conversation and mobilization. She says it's critical to avoid reproducing the individualism and colonial isolation that settler colonialism fosters. And I think both Angela and Clay have really talked about that importance of connecting and of relationship as we think about in a different, better world and for Indigenous people and indeed for all of us. I'd like to thank our guests for joining us today and thank our guests for joining us of this discussion on the conversation. Thank you all so much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Be well. <laughs>